We began the class with science, evolutionary science, thermodynamics, topology, uh, and I told you that the, to me those were the three branches of science that were the foundation for new materialism. <clears throat> then I try to show you that we could apply those ideas at the level of subjectivity, at the level of various social entities. Today we went a little more in depth in one of those social entities, cities, and I, and I showed you how we can go from the bare bones diagram that we did yesterday, and how do you then apply the flesh to those bones, right? That is, that is the method, right? That is the simplest theory. You begin with the bones. You make sure that the bones, that basic diagram, fits the ontology, so that you're not introducing entities that are not historical, that you don't know where, where they were, if they were born, if they can die, and they meet all the, if they have emergent properties. Once you define that, then you start adding layers of materiality. In the case of city, food, diseases, language, we could have added transportation, we could have added war, you know, cities as objects of war, the state of siege, the fortification architecture. But there's are just now layers of details that when you add it to the bones, now you at least know the bones are coherent with the rest of the philosophy, and now you are just not embellishing, but fleshing out, literally fleshing out. You need those bones first before you apply the flesh on them. Ooh, moon markers. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like a little kid, like a little kid right? And we're going to talk about the deepest. Ooh, candy. <laughs> So, having shown you that, I would want to go back to materiality. Because in the materialism that I'm peddling, you have to pay attention to matter and energy, to, to, to the world of matter and energy. The all materialism try to do it, you know, I'm talking about historical materialism and dialectical materialism, but as an afterthought. Materialism was supposed to be about labor, about physical labor of workers, which is, of course, a very important subject. And then, as, as an afterthought, Engels gave us his philosophy of nature. But I, I, would, I would wish that the new materialism did not proceed that way, did not put humans at the center of the action. Yeah, yes, we are important, but we are not the center of the universe. And we need to, and particularly now in, in, in the middle of an ecological crisis, with the possibility of global warming, with the possibility of all kinds of really bad things happening, all kinds of material things happening that are bad for us as humans, but that we have provoked precisely by not looking for where are the sensitive points, where are the critical intensive points that we are not supposed to touch, like that point of intensity of concentration of salinity near the North Sea where the Gulf Stream goes down. You need a certain amount of salt there. You need a, it's an intensive property. The, the degree of concentration of salt in, at that particular point because the Gulf Stream goes down, then it goes all the way down to the tropics and comes back up with heat from the tropics, which is, of course, what makes Europe not to have the same climate as Canada. You know, Canada is not very populated. It's certainly not nearly as populated as Europe is. And it's precisely because it's much colder. Europe should have that weather. But the Gulf Stream warms it up. But there is a critical point, there is a sensitive point on the Earth. It's that point near the North Sea where the Gulf Stream goes down. And you need the intensive quantity to be there, that amount of salt, that ratio of salt to water, the degree of concentration. You start melting the glaciers, fresh water starts flushing in, the, 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 the concentration of, of salt goes below its critical point, the Gulf Stream stops, Europe cool, cools out in what would be a mini ice age, and all hell is going to break loose, because do you really believe that the Europeans are going to just get out of here peacefully? They're going to nuke their way out, man. They're going to just go and get some new place to live. It's not going to be funny. And that is because of the lack of respect for sensitive, intensive, critical points on the Earth. We should be making maps of those sensitive points. We put a big sign. Stay the hell away from here. Now that means respecting materiality. Right? I, I began the public lecture saying that when I mentioned Fry Otto using soap bubbles to kind of meet materiality midway. Now, 
later on someone informed me that most of you are not artists. So, and I was using, I don't know, all the years I've come here, and most of you are artists. So I was kind of used to that, and that's why most of my examples came from, from art. But of course, it applies to anything. It applies to anything. Sociology, economics, anthropology, you always need to look for those critical points. That's intensive thinking logical thinking. So we're going to bring those back again, and I'm going to give you an, uh, one, one more go, one more layer of detail to the whole question of the importance of, of conceiving matter and energy correctly. So on one hand, we have epistemology. Kid. Many philosophers do, particularly non-realists. Even Hume. I used Hume the other day and I was defending Hume. I, I, I hope I didn't, didn't come across as Humean because I, the only part of Hume that I accept is his theory of subjectivity, the theory of subjectivity in terms of intensities. But Hume is not a realist, and I'm going to show you in what sense he's not. When he discusses causality, and of course, Causal relationships, cause and effect, is one of the most important aspects of materiality because we interact with materiality by intervening in reality causally, right? whether to vaccinate people and, and make them immune to diseases or whether to go plant and get food so that we can feed cities. We interact with materiality causally. So one thing that is incredibly important to get right is causality. What is causality? Now for Hume, who is not a realist, is a kind of an intermediate position between the world doesn't exist at all independently of our minds, the materialist position, the world is fully independent of our minds, and then there's the empiricist position, which is in the middle, which is things that we can see directly, dogs, cats, mountains, clouds, cars, exist independently of my mind, but things that I cannot see directly do not exist independently of my mind. So atoms, molecules, viruses, bacteria, black holes, uh, galaxies, and so on, do not exist independently of our minds. Of course, empiricists get in trouble the moment we add microscopes and telescopes to the question. The moment we add any kind of non-human sensors and detectors, of which science is inventing more and more every day. So like the most famous empiricist today, his name is Van Frassen, an American analytical philosopher. He will say to you, well, <clears throat> telescopes are okay because when we look through a telescope and we see Saturn's rings even though that's not unaided vision I can believe that Saturn's rings exist because I could go on a spaceship and position myself near Saturn and see the rings directly without a telescope but Van Frassen gets into trouble with microscopes because of course we cannot shrink ourselves to the size of our bacterium to see the bacteria in the way we would use it in a microscope so he would insist that bacteria are theoretical constructs. They do not really exist. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I, that's, that seems like a pretty flimsy argument. And it seems like an argument that depends on the technology of a century. Right? What, about, what about if you have several different microscopes operating on entirely different principles that do give you the same picture of the virus? Wouldn't that convergence make it almost impossible for that not to exist? At any rate, more important than viruses and bacteria and atoms and molecules are causality. What is causality? Causality you cannot observe directly. You observe the cause, you observe the effect, but you don't observe what happens in between. Now for, for Hume, and everybody always uses billiard balls as their example of causality, right? Let's continue that tradition, right? You observe a, bill, a, a table of billiard balls, and you observe someone hitting one ball, or you observe one ball moving, another one ball is here, static, then you observe the event collision, 
this, this ball hits the second ball, and then you observe that this ball it starts moving, and this one changes its movement and goes into the other side. Then you see it again. You see the collision, you see the change of movement. Then you see it again. You see the collision, you see the change of movement. For Hume, all that has happened is that we have built an association in our minds between collisions and changes in movement. And that is all that causality is. In other words, he defines causality as observed constant conjunction. The constant conjunction of the event collision with the event change in state of movement. But someone needs to be there observing it. Bad news. Right? Now, for a materialist like myself, Causality is a productive relationship between events. You don't have to watch it, see it, observe it, hear it, or flavor it. It's, an, it's, a, it's a relationship between watch one event, a collision, produces another event, the change of movement of the ball. Now, as I've already observed before, production is the basic category of any form of materialism. It was a basic category of historical materialism, industrial production. It was the basic category of dialectical materialism, the synthesis of opposites that, that Hegel had proposed, that Engels applies it to nature, but it's production. Right? And it has been the, at the center of the whole talk here, because we're, we've been talking about emergent properties that have to be produced, have to be constantly produced by the interaction between the component parts. They don't emerge out of nowhere. They emerge out of process of production. So what we, what I, one of the things that I would want to say today is that we, we need to follow that line. We need to continue thinking along that, at least in this class, right? Production being the, the main thing that we, want to, that we want to theorize. And therefore, causality, we need to rescue it from being observed constant conjunction, because whether you are a continental philosopher, you're an analytical philosopher, that's your definition of causality. Most Anglo-American philosophers are empiricists. Most continental philosophers are idealists. So where does that leave us? Right? I mean, those are the two main schools. Well, it leaves us nowhere. And I don't mind being nowhere, as long as I'm right. As long as we actually respect the world and try to actually find how it actually works. How does causality work? What are the mechanisms through which one event produces another event? Now, Hume by reducing causality to observe, constant conjunction confuses ontology and epistemology. Because, of course, observations of constant conjunction are evidence of causality. Right? You need to see those billiard balls hitting one another. And you need to see that a collision produces a change of movement in the, in the, in the balls that collide. And then you need to see it again. And then, okay, now do it from another angle. Now let me see it. Yeah. So seeing constant conjunction clearly is important. Seeing that one cause causes an effect that fire applied to a piece of paper produces the, makes the paper go on, on flames, that a match the second time makes the paper go on flames, that a match the third time go the paper go on flames. That's evidence for causality. But evidence is an epistemological category. It's a category about how we know that things happen. Well, we know because we've observed it over and over. We will observe that it's a regular relationship, a regular conjunction between one event and another event. We need that evidence. So let's put it on the right side of the blackboard. Evidence belongs to epistemology. Ontology, the ontology of causality, is this production relationship between events. And I would argue these events were producing these other events way before human beings were in this planet. If events had not been producing events way before we were here, we would not be here because we were produced causally by a process of evolution and by a process of making a living as hunter-gatherers, by a process of ur being urban but knowing where to get our food, how to protect against diseases, everything that we were talking about before. So let's keep the two sides of the board clearly so that we don't confuse them. At the epistemological level, then, we talked about topological thinking. This is a manner of explaining things, an explanatory strategy, and therefore belongs to epistemology. We also talked about intensive thinking. And we also talked about population thinking. 
These are again epistemological categories. These are names for explanatory strategies or modes of reasoning that apply to different spheres of ontological reality. This applies to virtual diagrams, which are the object of topological thinking, but nevertheless pre-exist the coming to be of humanity. Intensive thinking is all about productive processes. Since differences in intensity drive processes, many of which are morphogenetic, maybe many of which lead to the genesis or the birth of form, to the production of form. And finally, population thinking, we can apply it to, a, to, to actual products. Because he's telling us that productive processes are always recurrent. They, they, they repeat themselves. One and the same production process can, can, can occur many times, and therefore it will produce always a population of actual products, a collectivity of actual products, a multiplicity of actual products. Now, when, as a philosopher, you become fixated on the actual products only, you forget about the productive processes and you, and you forget about the virtual diagrams that guide the productive processes, in the sense that the, 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 the virtual diagrams capture the spatial possibilities for the capacities and tendencies of these productive processes, and we focus exclusively on actual products, then something happens. It's called essentialism. And I'm going to reintroduce a little bit about Aristotle here, but in a different way than the way I did the first talk. So it's going to be a slightly different angle. It's essentialism because what you do is this. You look at, a, at the final product, say a zebra. You list its properties. Remember that properties are listable because they are finite. right? So it's, it has the shape of a horse, it's a hair reward, has black and white camouflage, has this height, it has this eating habits, blah, blah, blah. You make a list of the properties, and you say, every zebra must have this property. These properties are the necessary and sufficient conditions to belong to the category zebra. If you don't have one of these properties, which are necessary to belong to the category zebra, well, then you are not a zebra. And then, Thus, that list of properties becomes reified into an essence. It's made into an eternal thing. This always has existed just like this. This is what Aristotle did. Now, I had already talked about that, and I'm going to repeat that. But it, it leads you to a second problem. A conception of matter and a conception of morphogenesis. Matter an inert receptacle for forms from the outside, from some platonic haven, from some transcendent world, world. That is the matter of essentialism. Matter really doesn't do anything, matter doesn't have any inherent morphogenetic capacities. For matter to have a form, an essence must come out, must come out from its eternal heaven and invest that form, that matter, with form. Form is just an inert receptacle that receives those forms from the outside. Well, you can immediately see the religious aspect of this. This is like creationism. In creationism, we, we do have that, precisely. Right? Matter is completely inert, and God has to come from the outside and order it to have form. Let there be light. Let there be plants and animals. Let there be form. Right? Meaning, matter cannot radiate 
uh, light on its own, that would be impossible. You, you need a psychic agency, a transcendent psychic agency to say, let there be light and command this obedient matter to follow the commands from God. Let there be plants and animals, let there be humans. So clearly the conception of matter is incredibly impoverished and puts all the emphasis as far as form production on either essences, that is necessary and sufficient conditions to belong to a category, or ideas or concepts in the mind of God. Because of course God must have had that desire Prior to saying, let there be light, he must have wanted light. He must have had the concept of light in his mind. So concepts come before matter. And this is actually right there in the Bible. There's a, at some point, I'm not sure if it's referring to Jesus Christ or referring to some other, some other thing in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but it's the phrase is, and the word becomes flesh. Right. The word becomes flesh. Everything starts as a word. Everything starts as language, of course, in a divine language. And then it becomes flesh via a command. Do this. Now, as a, for a materialist, this is clearly a, an incredibly impoverished view of what matter can do. And if this is what matter is, then we shouldn't even be materialists. Quite, let's just all be semioticians. The word comes first. The word comes first and then flesh comes afterwards. Well, let's study words. Let's become experts on words. Let's, be, let's go into hermeneutics and let's go into analyzing meanings of words. And then we worry about fleshy things. We obviously do not want to do that. So what I want to tell you right now is we need to conceive, of course, of matter as active. active agent in the production of form. So what we need to talk a little bit about is what exactly gives matter that active agency and the different forms of matter that we're going to find in the world, some of which seem to have more active agency and seem to, to, to be more expressive, others have less active agency and seem to be less expressive. So I'm going to give the conditions right now by turning the page and showing in each one of these forms of thinking how matter varies from one style to another. Yes? Um. Yes? that if we are going to believe in a matter that exists independently of our minds, ontologically, it has to be a matter that's interesting. If it's a matter that doesn't do anything, it's a matter that obeys laws, for instance, that follows laws and obeys laws, well, that would be, you, you might as well fixate on the laws themselves, which are the important thing, not the matter that just follows the laws. Deleuze distinguishes between minor sciences, well, Deleuze and Gattari, and royal sciences. Royal sciences are precisely all those physicists who think that they can find the final truth. He, he locates the, the, the cornerstone of major or royal science in the notion of law. The law of the eternal and immutable laws of nature. Now, I do not believe in the eternal and immutable laws of nature. That is to me a theological concept. That is precisely the kind of concept that was created in the times of Galileo and Newton and so on because there were Christians and because they had, in addition to being scientists and intervening causal in reality, they had to be promoters of science. They had to be promoters of science in front of the church. They had to be promoters of science to the aristocracy. They, had, they needed legitimacy for their field, for the royal academies and so on. And so they needed to, to have a face that you present to authority. Scientists do all kinds of different jobs, some of which are purely social, like promoting science, fighting for the legitimation of science, fighting for the increase in prestige of a field relative to another. All those are social activities that scientists engage in and continue to engage in, because there's only science is expensive, and there's only so much money that you're going to spend. There's always going to be battles over budgets. And so the word law 
was invented following that. You wanted to present your, the products of what you're discovering to the aristocracy that was paying for your bills in a way that seemed, hey, we're discovering the laws that God wrote in the book of nature using the language of mathematics. Right? Remember that was a famous Galilean expression. Now, what kind of expression is that? That's not a scientific expression. That is a legitimizing expression. You're trying to legitimize an organization, a scientific academy, in front of another organization, a government organization. And so it should be analyzed at that level using the assemblage theory that we had, what we presented yesterday. But when Galileo was doing his experiments, when he built his telescopes, when he was intervening causally in reality, when he was teaching others the skill of how to see through the telescope so that they could see the rings of Saturn, he was engaging in something else. He was in, engaging in causal interactions with reality. Even with a telescope, you're interacting causally because you're you are funneling light rays via an arrangement of lenses so that the end result is a focused image. You're interacting with light that's being sent from outer space. So that's the Galileo that's a scientist. And then there's the Galileo that was promoting science, or the Newton, when the Newton was the administrator of the Royal Society. So hence, in the, in, in the chapter of nomadology, the losing Gattari begin to reflect, well, what can we use from science? What can we use from what, with the, of the, all the epistemological products of, of science, concepts, true statements, problems, models, and so on, scientific instruments, what can we use? And they make that distinction. The science of the very famous, of the very prestigious, which always sided with the state and always was in direct relationship to government organizations, or the minor scientists, the ones that labored in obscurity in laboratories underneath the, the, the main building, like Robert Hooke, as opposed to, say, Boyle or Newton. Boyle and Newton were rich people who, who hang out with rich people. Robert Hooke was a paid laborer, but he made all the apparatuses, including the air pump, that others would use in their demonstrations with where it were, which were in front of gentlemanly witnesses, which were, of course, completely social events. Right? In the moment you choose as reliable witnesses rich people, you're already making a judgment on the basis of social ideas and social prejudices. But the guy downstairs, he wasn't doing that. He was causally intervening in reality, trying to build this apparatus, trying to make it work better, trying to perfect it. Robert Hooke is a minor scientist. And Deleuze and Guattari make very, very, very explicit that we should forget the ideology of royal scientists and their legitimation activities, forget it as far as philosophy is concerned, very important as far as science is concerned because science needed to find its place in society. Remember that when Galileo and Kepler began thinking, the only three subjects taught in medieval universities were law, old-fashioned non-clinical medicine, but it's medicine, textual medicine, and law, I mean, and theology. There was no, there was not a social space in the, in the didactic tradition of any country where science could fit. Scientists needed to create these little academies, these little clubs where they would get together and exchange results and eventually create those royal academies in which to promote their, their, their ideas precisely because they started from zero and they had no legitimacy whatsoever in the front of the rest of society. So as far as the history of science is concerned, we do need to, come to, to consider those social activities from the point of view of what can philosophy benefit from the knowledge that has been produced by scientists, so the Luz and Gattari tell us, forget about royal science and all its, and all its trappings. Right? You, it, you, and forget about the concept of eternal and immutable laws and the concept of a matter that just obeys those laws. This is, by the way, in nomadology. And... There is where they, you know, I, um, I can almost say to you verbatim, the model, the model that I just presented of the, 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 you know, matter as an inert receptacle for the, for the reception of forms that come from the outside, uh, <coughs> the Lewis calls it the hylomorphic schema coming from Aristotle. 
and he says, what prevents us from seeing matter as, a, as an active agent? What, what prevents us from confronting matter in its own activity and expressivity? The hylomorphic scheme, he says, and the notion of law. So we need to replace the notion of law with something that matter has, but that, is, that makes it active. And we, this is what we've been calling tendencies and capacities. So on one hand, we have laws, eternal laws. And this is the royal science concept. And of course, the concomitant obedient matter that just obeys the laws, that you know, doesn't, cannot have, doesn't have any say in anything, just obeys the laws. And tendencies, which he calls singularities. In fact, I'm going to have to borrow and capacities, which he calls affects. Okay. Well, let me just assume that nothing happened before. I'm going to start over again, okay? The idea here is that we do have to treat science carefully because science does have ideology in it. And why it has ideology in it? Because science has to justify itself to authorities and had to establish its own authority. That's how they came with the concept of an eternal and immutable law. They continue to believe in that concept. As philosophers, we cannot do that. We need to change our conception of materiality as something that has its own tendencies and its own capacities. Whether they are actually being manifested or exercised right now, it does not matter. In fact, it's better that they are virtual, because it shows that that the potential that that materiality has for a variety of different things. He, again, and if, if, I could, if I could have found that paragraph, you would have seen that he uses the word singularities and affects, but he's saying we must replace the concept of law by the concepts of singularities and affects. It's, it's, it's much clearer to say we must replace the concept of an obedient matter by a matter that has its own tendencies and its own capacities. So now let's start talking about that. First of all, matter. So we are getting rid of this. We don't believe in that. That is theological. But this is, gives, gives us a, a way of recovering materiality for a philosophy. So, but now we need to ask ourselves, under what conditions Matter displays its maximum number of tendencies and capacities. In only one conditions does matter exp expresses itself and the order, immanent order that, 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 that it belongs to. And under what conditions we do get indeed a matter that seems to be obedient and, and uh, sterile. Well, in terms of intensive thinking first, We can distinguish two conditions, at or near thermodynamic equilibrium, far from thermodynamic equilibrium. Those, by the way, writes about this in difference and repetition. This basically means intensive differences dissipated or dead. And this means intensive differences align. Or not cancel, not dissipate. So it's not to introduce any metaphor here. And 
This is just as far as intensive thinking is concerned. Remember what intensive thinking is. is to think that the most basic form of fuel to drive processes are gradients or differences in intensity, differences in temperature, differences in pressure, differences in speed, differences in concentration, differences in density. All of those are differences in intensity. As long as there, there's an intense enough difference, as long as those differences are alive and not cancelled, matter can drive morphogenetic processes. Matter is active. If we allow matter to either reach equilibrium, that is, if we allow the intensive differences to dissipate, to disappear, or even to become too small, so that matter now is near equilibrium, matter will start behaving just like Aristotle thought it would. Matter will become this inert receptacle for forms from the outside. You cannot do anything with matter at equilibrium because it's just, it doesn't, it's not being animated from the inside by intensive differences. Intensive differences must be kept alive. Otherwise, matter is not that it dies because it was never alive, but it ceases to have the capacities and tendencies that we are ascribing to it. So, in, on planet Earth, of course, the sun keeps replenishing those intensive differences every single day by heating up one side of the planet and they're getting the other one cold, and then vice versa. And for as long as the sun replenishes our intensive differences, this planet will be full of life, this planet will be full of variety, this planet will be the enchanted world that it really is. If the sun, for whatever reason, stops replenishing those intensive differences, then in about 24 hours, everything in this planet would go back to inert matter. There would not be wind patterns, there would not be atmospheric entities like hurricanes and tornadoes and thunderstorms. Plants would die, animals would die, humans would die. Now the problem with science is that, and this is Deleuze's argument in, uh, I mean the problem with physics in, 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 in uh, difference and repetition, he argues, spent about 100 years after discovering the steam engine as an object, thinking of thermodynamics at equilibrium. No wonder they never discover anything particularly interesting about matter. They, they concentrated on the concept of law, the second law of thermodynamics. And that was their great achievement. That's what they would present to kings and princes as our achievement. But the, the minor scientists working downstairs in the laboratory, they didn't care about this. They care about well, what happens when you don't let those intensive differences being canceled. And they continue to work and they continue to show that interesting things happen when you keep gradients alive. But because no one was doing the theoretical work to actually put it into, into, into practice, make it part of physics, far from equilibrium thermodynamics took a hundred years to emerge. Today, of course, it is one of, it's the most important part of thermodynamics and one of the most important parts of physics. Ilya Prigogine, which is the scientist that you would want to read if you want to know about this, won the Nobel Prize for this. So it's a very important achievement. He's the first one who formalized this Ilya, like that. The first one to formalize far from equilibrium thermodynamics. Let me just give you a little anecdote so you see what happened here. Prior to Prigogini, Prigogini wrote in the 60s, he died recently. He got the Nobel Prize sometime in the 80s. He wrote, by the way, if you want to read him, he wrote a book with a, philosopher, a French philosopher of science. His name is Isabel Stengers, which help, helps as far as readability because she is much better writer than he is. He's the one who's producing the, the scientific knowledge. She's the one who's giving form to the book. So if you want to read about Far From Equilibrium Thermodynamics and it's essential reading for any materialist, Get the book of Prigogine and Stengers. I don't want to write it down too. Because Prigogine's books by themselves are a little hard to. It's, they're a little too technical. They are, there's a mathematical equation in every paragraph and so on, so you've got to get used to that. In the book he writes with Stengers, he develops these ideas. Now, our atmosphere as I showed you yesterday, is of course a far from equilibrium system. Our bodies are far from equilibrium system. Thermodynamic equilibrium, as far as our bodies are concerned, is death. 
The moment you die is the only moment you are at equilibrium. Outside of that particular event, we are constantly keeping ourselves far from equilibrium by eating food, by consuming new energy and replenishing those intensive differences throughout our bodies. And that's what keeps us alive. That's what keeps us as thinking subjects to moving, causally moving our bodies every day far from equilibrium, not allowing our bodies to reach equilibrium and die. But the same thing applies to every material system. Today, most laboratories around the world, chemical laboratories as well as physical laboratories, study far from equilibrium thermodynamics because they discovered those are, that's the exciting field. There's nothing exciting about this. And let me just give you an example of how hard it was to get here. In the 1950s, before Prigogine wrote and, he, and won his Nobel Prize, a Russian chemist, his name is Belusov, was trying an experiment in his laboratory. He was a minor scientist, the one who worked with his hands and used his know-how to get things done. And he was combining substances that had been tinted with different colors, like red and blue. I can't remember right now the exact colors. He was putting them on a transparent vat to combine and react with one another. You, 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 you take two million molecules that are red, two million molecules that are blue, and what you get, if you think in terms of thermodynamic equilibrium, is a purple mess. Right? The, the red and the blue are going to combine, they're going to become purple. But Belusov kept the system, kept the vessel far from equilibrium by plugging energy through it. Right? He connected it, so to speak, to the electrical socket. So there would be energy going through the system instead of an isolated system. And what he saw was entirely different. By pushing his system far from equilibrium, when he dropped the red and blue color things, what he saw is an incredibly complex chemical reaction which was producing all red color molecules for five seconds, all blue color molecules for five seconds. All red, all blue, all red or blue. He was the first one to witness a chemical clock, a self-organized, emergent chemical clock. That beat was a perfect beat. People who came to his laboratory, we're talking about the 50s, it's not that long ago, couldn't believe it. They would be looking for mirrors and smoke and strings or something. There's got to be some kind of a trick. Because for 150 years we've learned that matter just dies and that we have to study it at, the, at, at best at near equilibrium with very little gradients, with very small differences in intensity. Belusov, as a minor scientist, disobeyed that order. He increased the differences in intensity. And what he saw was magic. A self-assembled chemical clock, which was defying all the laws in the world. He couldn't publish his essence. This is where society comes in. Since every member of the scientific community did not believe this was possible, no one wanted to publish his essays. These are going to be like the end, the famous end race at the beginning of the 20th century, or called fusion, or one of those things that you announce and then people try to repeat it and it turns out to be a fraud. So no one wanted to take a chance with this because it was too miraculous to be true. Belusov finally managed to publish his results on an obscure Soviet magazine in 1959 and died unknown, like most minor scientists. Prigogine rediscovered his work, now using mathematics, proved exactly what was going on here and showed that this was a, a, a true phenomenon, an objective true phenomenon. All basically Prigogine did was to use topological thinking to create the phase space of the reaction and show that there was an attractor in the form of a loop. That's all he had to do. But nobody was doing it. Why? Because everybody was in love with the concept of law, with the second law of thermodynamics. That's a law that you cannot break. Whereas the minor scientists were experimenting, tinkering, adding things. Let's see what happens if you do this. Let's see what happens if you do that. Those are the scientists that the Lewis is telling us, trust those guys. Don't trust the other guys. The other guys have been working for the state, have been working for government organizations, and have been working for the legitimacy of their field all their lives. And that's why they stick to certain vocabulary, which is through and through social. It's about legitimacy, legitimacy, it's about prestige. Minor scientists are into know-how and causal interventions in reality, and that's how they 
discover chemical clocks. Today we know that chemical clocks are everywhere, certainly everywhere in our bodies. Every cycle that is reliable in our bodies, the sleep-awake cycle, the menstrual cycle, the temperature cycle, the, uh, uh, the hunger and satiation cycle, are chemical clocks, not like the salts, but made out of enzymes, but enzymes that, in their, inter in their causal interactions, have a periodic attractor in their, in their diagram, and the whole assemblage produces reliable cycles. So today we understand that matter, even dead matter, can actually beat like a heart. That, that matter has a beat. That matter can begin pulsating rhythmically, entirely on its own, as long as we push it away from equilibrium. Yeah? So, first, this is now a combination of ontology and epistemology, because it's epistemology that's guiding us there, but it's, it's an epistemology that's telling us there are certain areas of reality that are, are going to be richer in behavior. There are other areas of reality that are going to be poorer in behavior. If you focus on the poor expressivity of matter in those areas of reality where it behaves at equilibrium, you're going to get a, a very impoverished vision of what matter can do. So look for the areas of reality that are far from equilibrium. Look in, in any place of the world, in the, in the economic world, in the uh, sociological world, in the, in, the, in the linguistic world, like we saw this morning. Right? This morning we saw language at equilibrium, standard languages homogenized and, and, and incapable of changing, as deliberate interventions to try to freeze language. And we saw what happens when you push language far from equilibrium which in this case means removing the authority of the church, removing the authority of poets and, and, and others who have written that particular language, whether it was because of the fall of the Roman Empire or because of the invasion of the Normans in England, as we saw this morning, language that was pushed far from equilibrium and it began begetting new languages. Right? Where, and, and, and of course there were the... the, 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 the you know, the people who work for the state, people who work for the government, those who create the royal academies, who wanted to bring language back to equilibrium, where it doesn't change, where we, we, where we can count on the fact that it's going to be inert from now until several centuries in advance. They didn't like what they saw, language being creative and beginning new, new, new dialects. They wanted equilibrium. So there's clearly an ideological component here. An ideological component that has kept us away from the correct areas of reality where we're going to find this expressivity and where we're going to find something to commit ourselves as materialists. So, first distinction. Near at or near equilibrium, far from equilibrium. This produces complex behavior, this produces interesting behavior, this produces creative behavior, this produces monotonous, uniform, homogeneous behavior. If you focus on this, you're going to end up with a conception of matter like that of Aristotle. If you focus on this, you're going to introduce a new conception of matter. Who studies this? Minor scientists. Who studies that? Royal scientists, major scientists, who like their laws, who like the second law of thermodynamics. Now let me introduce another distinction between linear and non-linear causality. There are many distinctions to be introduced. I'm going to be able to introduce only a few. I'm going to have to give you a break soon. Now let's take a very simple example. Remember what I said about causality at the beginning of the class. Causality, for most empiricists and idealists, is observed constant conjunction. The, 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 you observe that there's a regularity in, in, the, in the, the one event that acts as a cause, and regularly it produces an event that is the effect. But it's the observation of it that is causality. That's for Kant as well as for Hume. We want something else. We want a causality without an observer. So we want causality as a relationship in, one, in which one event produces another event. Right? So, but even given that, Linear causality is going to give us a very poor vision of what causality is capable of. Nonlinear causality will give us a much more elaborate one. Let me just choose a very simple example, one that uh, Robert Hooke himself created, just to stick to the same minor scientist 
that we just uh, studied. Now, Robert Hooke, he was a minor scientist, but that doesn't mean that he didn't want it to be a major scientist. Right? He wanted the money, he wanted the position, he wanted the prestige, so he wanted his own law. And he got it. It's called Hooke's Law. <coughs> What he did basically is he hung, took a string, a metal string, he attached it to the ceiling or to some metal plant, and then he hung from here a particular weight. And all he, he wanted to establish simply is the relationship between ch uh, uh, the event change in the amount of weight that the string is sustaining, that's one event. The other, the other event is the becoming deformed of the spring. If the weight is pulling, they're becoming longer of the spring. If the, if the weight is pushing, they're becoming shorter of the spring. In other words, he wanted to relate weight or load and deformation. It was very simple. He put, added one weight, the spring extended that way. He added double the weight, the spring got twice as long. I'm not even drawing it correctly, but I will in a second. He put three times the weight, the spring deformed, becoming three times as long. And then all he did is he plotted it in a piece of paper. Load, this is deformation. If the load was one weight, the deformation was one unit. If the, load, if the load was two, the deformation was two units. If the load was three, the deformation was three units. And then he just joined them by a line. And that is called Hooke's Law. It simply says, the amount, in, in a linear causality relationship, the amount of deformation is proportional to the load. Not a big deal, but nevertheless, it has its name, Hooke's Law. I'm not even going to write it down because it, it doesn't really matter. The poor guy was hardly paid anything for working downstairs. He was a real minor scientist. We can forgive him having desired to be a major scientist, having desired to be a royal, having, want, having wanted to have his own law. Now let me give you examples of nonlinear causality. I'm going to make them a little smaller. This is still load, pushing or pulling. This is still deformation. So the event is changing the amount of pulling or changing the amount of, uh, of pushing. That's an event, a change. And the other event is the becoming deformed of the particular material that we're using. And we, well, this is, by the way, characteristic of metals, particularly mild metals, like mild steel. And there is a very useful characteristic. Mild steel behaves in a very domesticated way, in a very predictable way, in a very proportional way. You know that if you triple the weight, the length will be tripled. You quadruple it, it will quadruple. Everything is proportional, everything seems to fit that sense of simplistic rationality that many scientists used to have, where laws have to be simple because God would not create a, a world that's more complex than that. But now let's take, for instance, organic tissue, like the tissue in your lip. If you pull right now on your lip a little bit, you're going to realize that a tiny little pull stretches it a lot. A tiny little pull stretches it a lot. But then, it doesn't matter how far you keep pulling, or how strong you keep pulling, the thing is not going to go any harder. The way you plot that, if we plotted it, the amount for, of load for deformation, we would get a curve like this. That's a non-linear causal effect. This means that for very small changes in pulling, very small changes in the load, it's a very large amount of deformation. That's what happens at the beginning. But then after that inflection point, it doesn't matter how hard you keep pulling, you can, you can pull and pull and pull, and now the thing is not deforming whatsoever. Right? It's not moving in that direction at all. That's a nonlinear response curve. 
It's a more complex form of behavior. I'm not saying it's something spectacular, but it is nonlinear. You can see that it does not form a line, it is not proportional. It begins to show thresholds, critical thresholds. The low a certain threshold, pulling will extend the lip. Past the third threshold, any amount of pulling will not pull the lip. Now think of, for instance, rubber, as in a rubber balloon. Everybody has inflated rubber balloons for a party. And you know how they behave. You at first, you're, of course, now you're going to be exerting the load from inside because you're putting air into the balloon. And what we're measuring right now is the amount of pressure that you're putting on the walls of the inside of the balloon. Right? So a balloon, when you first try to, 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 to blow it, you blow as hard as you can, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything at all. Right? In other words, you augment the load and it hardly moves in the direction of deformation. Then all of a sudden, and at a point that most people find like kind of almost magical, you go and you do a little more and the balloon begins inflating almost by itself. So now the curve goes almost straight because it's very little load and it's going in that direction. And yet it gets to the point where you now and the balloon doesn't move anymore. It's going to explode if you keep putting things. At that point, the balloon has made a curve like so rubber reacts to causes, in this particular case, loads, in a non-linear way. It has a very different shape than organic tissue. Now scientists have privileged linear behavior for at least 300 years. For, it, it just seemed more rational. It seemed more like the kind of thing that God would have invented. The moment they got rid of God, and they became professional scientists, they began exploring all kinds of other things and they began to find that, that it is much more magical, the behavior of nonlinear materials, because it's much more varied. It has variations, it has thresholds. Now, by the way, and this is, I'm going to let you take a break in a second. The, term, the, the dichotomy linear and nonlinear is only a dichotomy superficially, because in fact, it is not two different cases. There's only one case of linearity, and there's like a hundred different reaction curves for different materials. So it's not as if you had a dichotomy. Rather, the linear case is an extreme case of nonlinearity. The extreme simple, the most the simplest case of nonlinearity, so to speak. Not a term in a dichotomy. Right? This was something that uh, uh, Enrico Fermi from the Manhattan Project has said already when referring to linear equations and nonlinear equations. He famously said sometime in the 40s to say, to speak about, to say that I am a mathematician that studies nonlinear equations is like saying I'm a zoologist that's, uh, what? Uh, yeah, I'm an, I, I am a non, a non elephant zoologist. Meaning, I'm a zoologist that studies everything but elephants. And there's so many other types of animals that you would never call yourself a non-elephant zoologist. Right? You would never exclude this just one case. Well, that's the same with the term non-linear, which unfortunately we're stuck with. It's not, it's not like we could change it. Non-linear is a nonsense term because it assumes that linearity is the norm, whereas in fact non-linearity is the norm. And linearity is just a special case. It happens to have focus the activity of scientists for 200 years, but today, retrospectively, we can tell that was a mistake. Scientists were overlooking the most exciting parts of reality. Now, when we come back from lunch, we're going to start mixing these two things, because we're going to start to see how you need to combine far from equilibrium conditions, that is, intense enough differences, with nonlinear response times, in order to get the full, you know, expressivity of matter. And that will, it will be like making maps of reality, just like the Lucent Gattari had asked us to do, maps of reality in which certain maps will show this area of the world is totally at equilibrium and is totally linear, it's going gonna, it's gonna to display boring behavior. Let's look for all those areas of the world that are non-linear and far from equilibrium, where we're going we're gonna to find materials, you know, exhibiting creative behavior. And if, uh, you know, as either as artists or as thinkers, we would want to be able to 
concentrate, we want to be able to do justice to the world by not focusing on the least interesting parts and always making maps of where the most interesting parts are and study those most interesting parts. It is those from where, you know, it's the non-linear cases, far from equilibrium cases, from which a materialist philosopher can learn the most. Let's start with a simple example, one that I already gave you. The process is the solidification of water, but it can take place in two entirely different conditions. It's the same material, water, the same intensity, temperature, the same critical threshold, zero degrees centigrade. So there shouldn't be that much of a difference. And yet, if the process of crystallization of water occurs in linear conditions, near equilibrium, you, all you get is what, what, what Deleuze calls boring or false repetition. In the book, difference in repetition. It is repetition without variation, repetition without difference. And what he's trying to promote in that book is, of course, repetition with difference, repetition with variation. Again, we saw this today in the talk about in the this morning in the talk about language. A language without variation is boring, is sterile, is, is repetitive in a boring kind of way. A language far from equilibrium whether the conditions far from equilibrium is like the injection of, of African particles and pigeonization by slaves, or it is simply the collapse of, of, of authority and the lack of enforcement of, of certain rules for phonetics, semantics, and syntax, that language goes back for, uh, away from equilibrium, and now even though it still repeats itself, it's the same language one generation that passes to the next generation that passes to the next generation, it has now more variety, it has more color, he has more expressivity. Now it is Deleuze who created the notion of the expressivity of matter. You know, partly for aesthetic purposes, partly to replace the notion of the sublime, partly to, you know, or if not to replace but to try to explain the notion of the sublime. It is when, when we confront something that, that moves us, some natural vision that moves us deeply, it will typically be something that is very expressive. And when we inquire into the conditions on, under which that mountain, that cloud, or that particular object, that, that fire in a fireplace, uh, why is it fascinating? Or why is it so expressive? Or a thunderstorm that's expressing itself through thunder and lightning that you know, many tribal societies thought were angry gods talking to you. Well, that's expressivity of matter, but that expressivity only occurs under very specific causal and energetic conditions, non-linear and far from equilibrium. So the law says, it is our duty as thinkers not to let matter hide itself, hide its potential, hide its expressivity under linear, near equilibrium conditions, you know, it's our duty to, not only to do it to matter, but to do it to our lives, to keep our lives far from equilibrium, to keep our lives being non-linear, to keep our, the repetition of our routines to have some kind of variation, not to, let our, not to let ourselves trap into the same thing that you do over and over and over again, which becomes a very boring, very non-expressive life. Now, artists know this. They find the style that sells, and you keep making paintings on the style that sells, Sooner or later you become not only bored with your art, but disenchanted with art. The only way of maintaining that sense of enchantment, that sense of marvel, that sense of awe, 
is by continuously pushing yourself away from your routines, you're going to have some, to have some kind of routines to keep you sane, and you, can, you don't want to push too, too hard or too extreme because you might risk madness. As Deleuze says, we must destratify, we must deterritorialize, but deterritorialization must be done carefully. That's, you know, it, it's not, he, they say, and I'm not, not, not going to try and find the quote, but it, he says, it's not wisdom that we're talking about here. It's caution. You need to push yourself away from equilibrium, but one degree at a time. Not just push yourself into some kind of extreme situation just because, it's, because there's such a thing as too far from equilibrium. After all, a nuclear mushroom is, in, is way much far from equilibrium than we are as human beings. And a nuclear mushroom, as awesome and, and hypnotic as it can be, clearly is not a very creative thing. It destroys things. And, it, and nothing comes out in a, more, in a true morphogenetic way, the way in which it does come out out of living creatures. So always deterritorialize, always push yourself away from equilibrium, carefully, with caution. Always add variation to your routines. So when he starts talking like that, now that's ethical talk. Now he's using the word duty. It is our duty to allow matter to express itself. It is our duty to prevent matter from, from giving us an impoverished version of the plane of immanence. This kind of matter would seem to suggest that the plane of immanence, the, the, the assemblage of all structures, of all spaces of possibilities, the, the, the assemblage of all diagrams, is, ri is incredibly rich and we have a duty to allow that richness to be expressed in this world as artists or as writers. If we allow these conditions to prevail in our life, if we allow these conditions to prevail in our work, we are doing a disservice to the plane of eminence. We are, in a way, betraying the plane of eminence by allowing an impoverished version of it to be manifested. So he's talking about duty. What, what could that possibly mean in this context? After all, all we're talking about is causal interventions on reality, which, as the, as the example of the atomic bomb, can be very unethical, or in the sense that you kill millions of people. And so how can that this possibly be related to ethics? Well, the, eth the ethics that he's talking about are the ethics of Spinoza. Spinoza is famous for having distinguished morality which is of course about essences, about great five generalities, good, versus evil in general and for having, I mean, for having distinguished morality from ethics. <coughs> which is about right and wrong but defined in a very specific way. several examples in his book. Some of the mixtures are material mixtures, like the mixture of your body with food, or the mixture of your body with poison. So some of the mixtures are mental, or if you want, affective mixtures, like the mixture of sadness with your body, or the mixture of joy with your body. Sadness can, particularly high intensities, can break you down can degrade you, so you lose a son, you lose a daughter, you lose a loved one, and the grief is so intense that it breaks you. From then on you have, you walk with your head down, you don't, you don't look up, you are not like searching, you are not looking at the sky, or looking at the stars anymore. Sadness now has broken you, you're a broken person. You're less than you were, you have less capacities than you had before. Joy, in the sense of the joy of daily life, of learning how to, how to live and how to add happiness from small, tiny little things. 
in, in your everyday life is something that nourishes you, that enhances your capacities. So he's talking both about material mixtures, he's talking about affective mixtures, and he, he gives many other examples. But now, the question is, let's, let's put here food as one example versus poison. Isn't this just good and evil? Isn't this just a dichotomy, just like the other one? Only all we are doing is changing the words. You know, perhaps it's a little bit less essentialist, but we're basically saying that food is good and that poison is evil. What exactly was the progress here? Well, it is wrong to think that way because this is about intensive thresholds. A little bit of poison makes you stronger. Too much food kills you. Too much food degrades you. So there's nothing inherent in food that makes it enhancing, that makes it, that makes it nurturing. And there's not, nothing inherent in poison that makes it degrading. It's the ratios, it's the proportions, it is the intensities. And because everybody has a different metabolism, we don't know in advance the amount of food that will become degrading for you or versus the amount of food that will become degrading for me. We don't know how large an amount of poison will still be enhancing in your case. Perhaps that, that same amount of poison will kill me. In other words, we need to experiment. We need to actually try things out to see what mixtures enhance us and, gives and, and increases our capacities both at our capacities to affect and our capacities to be affected. There's our receptivity of beautiful things, for instance, our capacity to be affected by a sunset, a capacity to be affected by a beautiful landscape. And what mixtures degrade our capacities to affect and be affected? Now this is almost an environmental ethics, if you think about it. I'm going to write a little formula here that summarizes Phosphorus is one of those many chemical elements that are a nutrient. It's, it's, you, you, can, you add it to just about every fertilizer that you have out there. Nourishes the soil. Too much. poisons it. Okay, this is, this is a situation that, that arises over and over and over again in an ecological context. Farmers buy fertilizer. Fertilizer contains phosphorus. But if a farmer thinks linearly, that is, the more, you know, the more phosphorus I add, the better it will be for the soil. But if he doesn't realize that there might be a point of saturation beyond which that phosphorus is not even being absorbed at all, you know, he thinks that the curve of adding phosphorus and enhancing the, and enhancing the earth is a line. The more I add twice as much phosphorus, it will get twice as much nutrients. I add three, three times as much phosphorus, it will be three times as, as capable of sustaining life. But of course, it is nonlinear, and it's a curve like that. Past a certain point, the soil doesn't absorb any phosphorus anymore. And what happens is that the rain washes it out, carries it away to the nearest stream. It goes downstream over that river and it gets deposited in somebody else's land. The, 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 the accumulation of phosphorus, uh, the accidental accumulation of phosphorus on land is, is such a recurrent problem for farmers that it even has a name. It's called eutrification. And many farmers don't mind it because it doesn't happen to their own farms. It happens to somebody else's farm downstream. But once you begin, particularly if you're a government agency like the Environmental Protection Agency, considering not only your interests but the interests of the entire community of farmers in a, in a large area, they can come and tell you, look, what you're doing is irresponsible. What you're doing is unethical. You're adding way too much phosphorus to the land 
and in, your, in the belief that that's going to enhance its capacities to sustain life, and, and in fact, you are doing it to your lamb because the excess phosphorus is being washed out, but it's killing somebody else's lamb down there. The mixture that is causing down there is a mixture that degrades life, that degrades the capacities of soil to sustain plant life. So it is unethical what you're doing. Not immoral, because it has nothing to do with good and evil, but it's unethical. How much phosphorus can you add to your soil before it becomes poison? Well, it's an experimental matter. Why? Because it depends on the composition of the soil, what other chemicals are in the soil. It depends on the physical structure of the soil, how large are the granules that form the soil, because that, that's, going to depend, that's going to determine the percolation of, of, of water carrying phosphorus down. If, they are, if the granules are large enough, there will be plenty of empty spaces, so there will be a lot of percolation of water. If it's too dusty, the soil, there will be very little percolation, the phosphorus will tend to stay at the surface. And just like those variables that I just mentioned, there are three or four more. So you cannot tell in advance how much phosphorus will be good, or what, how, rather, how much phosphorus will be right, and how much phosphorus will be wrong. You have to experiment. You have to intervene causally in reality, and then be respectful of that reality. Be respectful of the fact that you are literally and objectively changing the capacities of that soil to sustain life. And you have to take that as an ethical, uh, you know, the consequences of your actions when you intervene causally into reality are ethical consequences. You are degrading, you are damaging, you are making the world less, less expressive of all the potential things that it could do. You are suppressing that potential. So, when Deleuze tells us that we should make maps of in intensity, as he calls them, you know, locating those areas of the world in which matter behaves non-linearly and far from equilibrium, and therefore in very interestingly, from those areas of the world in which matter behaves linearly and near equilibrium, he is telling us we need those maps to guide our experiments. We need those, guide, those maps to guide our life. But the same thing happens with a variety of other types of mixtures. Now, the word mixture is, 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 is Spinoza's, so it, 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 I would say that we could change it for assemblage. So for instance, many things that come out in moral, in the old morality, like slavery, the humiliation of women by men, or the uh, exploitation of workers by certain bosses, uh, things that we would consider immoral, unethical, also come out wrong on the other side of the board. Because they are now mixtures, not literally physical mixtures, but assemblages of people in which one part of that assemblage is degrading another part of that assemblage. I suppose that this, would, this is perfectly clear in the case of slavery. Right? You're degrading the bodies of the slaves. You're reducing the life expectancy. You, you're by tilting the sex ratio in, 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 in uh, uh, slave plantations towards males. You're creating a situation that is unsustainable, and you're not even allowing them the minimal social life to occur. Them. And you might think, well, the master of the slave at least is being, being enhanced since he's the one who's reaping all the wealth, and that is to a certain extent true. But the masters. The master also loses something. He loses empathy. He loses his capacity to feel what other people can feel. And that is a degradation because it's degrading a capacity. Your capacity to be affected by other people's suffering. Now you develop a thick skin, you become very jaded, you are almost, in, in, you know, you invent all kinds of people. They are inferior anyway. Maybe they are not even human. Why should I feel bad for them? You can invent all kinds of excuses, but what happened really there has nothing to do with words. You have lost the capacity. You have lost the capacity for, for empathy. Your capacity to actually feel what someone else is feeling. And that is degrading. So the master-slave relationship is degrading both ways, although clearly most of the degradation is born by the slave. Now let's take other examples. Let me take a silly example first. Everybody knows couples that, you know, romantic couples that bring the best out of each other. 
everybody wants them in the party because they actually bring the best out of each other. The mixture of the two enhances both of them. They are both full of laughter, they are both full of joy, and they communicate that joy to people around them. You want them in the party. And everybody knows couples that bring the worst out of each other. You meet them apart, and they are actually relatively nice persons, each on his own, right? the guy, the girl. But you put them together, and you know, they arrive at the party, and uh, you know, I told you not to buy that cheap wine. You know, what I mean? well, you should have bought the wine yourself, bitch. You know, and then all of a sudden they begin poisoning the party. As long as they are together, bitching and, and bickering and so on, you know, nobody wants to be around them. People go, who invited this couple to the party? Now that's a silly example, but nevertheless it shows you that this is applicable to an ethics of everyday life, of everyday situations like party, who do you invite, who, who can be the soul of the party, who can bring joy to the party, and who brings degradation, sadness, depression to the party. In a